October 15th. Supposed to be a Libran administering peace by star sign. But it did not work for uh, Nietzsche. And at the age of 24, when we are all listening to others talk about Nietzsche, he became the chair of philosophy at Basel. A very remarkable student. And he was a philologist turned philosopher. Influenced by Schopenhauer, Wagner, and be sure it was music that united them. And the great, or the, as I said, the assassination attempts which he made on European modernity and its claims to truth, objectivity, everything. It is difficult to imagine that it came from a person suffering from tertiary syphilis or a kind of tumor of the brain. Many people say that the kind of insights that he expressed were the result of his neuro neurotic disorder. So these are all the kind of uh, theories that surround Nietzsche. See, people are trying to pin theories on him to imagine that he tried to destroy the world destroy the certainties of the world in a particular way and Dr. K. P. Dr. Raj Shagrin Nair's book actually uh, I read it it's a Malayalam book which actually speaks of uh, the typical Nietzsche disease the neurotic disorder as a result of tertiary syphilis or this kind of cancer of the brain okay I think he is a mystery clothed in an enigma, as you would call Cleopatra or uh, Mona Lisa, for that matter. And my question, or the kind of thing in which I try to look at, is typically on Nietzsche as a genealogist. In his book, which is alternatively titled as, translated as, on the genealogy of morals or on the genealogy of morality we have this beautiful con concept called genealogy which is not just origin but it is an emergence it is a descent and emergence and if you would refer Foucault's essay on him, Nietzsche, genealogy, history, Foucault says that he uses three terms to refer to origin. Nietzsche uses three terms to refer to origin. One is the common thing in which we thrive to look for our origins. We are all proud of our origins and we try to point our origins to a particular point. We consider it as the most, say, innocent of all spaces. Maybe very pure, unadulterated. And this point of inquiry is the earth's prime, which which uh, to Nietzsche is very lowly, very ordinary. That is not where we should look for our origin. Then he advances another term, which is Herkunft, which is a kind of descent. So as part of genealogy, when we search for our origins, origin as a point, a point we, we think is great and graceful, but which is not so, which could be very lowly 
as you would find and how it destroys or deconstructs our notion of the divine. We think that God created the world and human being in his likeness as Judeo-Christian tradition would say. But as that beautiful sentence in Foucauldian essay would say, So, any Nietzschean discourse is supposed to have such reversal of forces. So, I suppose we would continue. So, the Ursprung is a point of origin which is an attempt to capture the exact essence of things, the purest possibilities and their carefully protected identities. That is what he says. But when we look back, we would find that, that beautiful sentence, that's where I was stuck. A monkey stands at the gate to heaven because Darwin had already brought his hammer onto the head of Judeo-Christian morality. So how the divine is just turned to a bestial origin. So any search for origins, if you, when you actually reach a worldly, uh, an important position, there is always this tendency to go back to our roots. So going back to our roots may not be that entertaining or I would say heartwarming. Sometimes origins are best left as origins per se. And he says that instead, a genealogy of values, morals, asceticism and knowledge will never confuse itself with a quest for their origins. It will cultivate the details and accidents that accompany every beginning. So that is where genealogy differs from a mere search for origins. It does not just celebrate the glorious, it also celebrates the not so glorious, the fallacies, the foibles and the falls of where we have fallen also. It is not just our rise but our fall also is important in tracing our descent. But often our search for origin is a search for the great and the graceful. We ignore where we fell. We could just, you know, whenever you read the autobiographies or the biographies of great people or even interviews by great writers or so-called great personalities, we see that there is a, a kind of invisible space, that grey matter, that dark space is there, where you don't speak about what is not so happy in your origin. The second term which he uses in his genealogical approach, which is not just genealogy but it, it approaches close to it, is the term Herkunft, which I said earlier. It is translated generally as stock or descent. It is the ancient affiliation to a group. So instead of looking for a single point of origin, you are actually ready to, ready to acknowledge you as part of a bigger group. And this, en this enquiry into the origin, that is, Herkunft, when you have that term, 
that kind of an inquiry for your origin seeks the subtle, singular and sub-individual marks that might possibly intersect to form a network that is difficult to unravel. So we are actually found as a core in the wheel in the second term. And it also makes us think that the beginnings of things are the accidents, the minute deviations, or conversely, complete reversal. So every great occasion in history could be just a, an accident. It could be just an accident that created the world. It could be just an accident that give you a new prime minister. It could be just an accident that you have a new principal. So all these things, it is not just a whole great planning. So we actually look for a lot of cosmic planning behind everything. Because that gives us kind of pleasure, a kind of happiness. Okay, I am living in a world which is well charted, which has a predestined existence. No. It just happens. And it is probably, as Foucault beautifully says, a dice box of... It is the iron hand of necessity shaking the dice box of chance that makes your birth. So you celebrate your birthdays, you celebrate your wedding, and a lot of other things. What is the point? It is just one of those things that just happened. It could have been anything else. And in the third term, which probably makes us closer, another thing about this term, Herkunft, is that the body is considered as the domain of the descent. Because the sins of our forefathers, the sins of our clan, the negatives of our descent is, weighted up, is actually vested upon our body. It becomes a site for all contested force in our heredity. You have a blood pressure or a tuberculosis or any other disease because you are, you've descended from a particular clan, a particular race, a particular family. And your body is a space of contestation of all these I would say, whatever has been coming through. And you could read it in conjunction with the kind of philosophy that was existing at the time, which is that of naturalism. Because I think Tain, and most of us, I don't know if it is prescribed for most students, Emily Zola's Nana, and Flaubertian world would show how human beings are probably driven by bestial tendencies and the bestiality and the micro desires of the family is vested in body as descent and that is the space of herkunft so i'm actually talking about the three terms which nietzsche used to refer to origin because genealogy is tracing your history a kind of historical sense and Historical sense is not just looking for that point of origin. It's okay. Any charge or? Historical sense is not just looking for that point of origin. It is also taking into cons consideration its working on your body, body politic also. The third term, which is closer to this idea of genealogy, is the term an Enstehung, which is which means emergence. It is Herkunft and Enstehung together that would give us this sense of workleach history or effective history, which could be very close to the genealogical approach. It is an emergence. And every emerg emergence, that concept actually gives you lots of freedom. A lot of freedom because 
emergence actually concentrates on each and every episode not as a final definite the last but instead it is merely a current episode in a series of subjugations and arising from the difficulties of eating shelter revenge wars disease national disasters etc and genealogy per se tries to establish various systems of subjugation uh, subjugation that has happened so what i'm trying to say is that nietzsche was trying to dislodge and destabilize the notions of christian morality or the the kind of idea that world is a result of a preconceived notion of grace which is created for the greatest of beings to live instead it just happened in an accident and it continues through accidents and it is this genealogical approach that would actually enable you not to over glorify the kind of positions that we are in we are just on in this moment on a planet because it just happens it does not have any more extra importance that is how we have to look at every moment so that it ceases to become very painful when you leave it and no moment of glory is ultimate and we think that we create this world out of great project and of great plans but nietzsche would say it is produced through a particular stage of forces and a lot of errors have led to our present state and more errors would soon follow it is because of these things that he has often been associated with nihilism probably active nihilism but i personally think it would actually make you prepare for leaving the world at any moment and not attach over glory to things and so after speaking about and this uh, we we spoke about a series of subjugation and this relationship of domination is there and this is not a relationship at all it is fixed throughout its history in rituals in meticulous procedures that impose rights and obligation so it is actually we are part of a whole continuum and as i said earlier it is the iron hand of necessity shaking the dice box of chance make you king today and a pauper tomorrow so now it is this historical sense that has been momentous in bringing out this idea of genealogy he brought in a new approach into looking at history not as a pre-planned one but as something that has happened by chance by accident and he said that the belief in the christian god has become unbelievable and because it was unbelievable it had become unbelievable everything that was built upon this faith propped up by it including the whole of our european morality is destined for collapse and we actually claim a lot about having a moral conscience somebody asked madhu sir a question about conscience we think we have and nietzsche actually tried to cut this idea by saying that the morality that we, we claim is also not based on any divine origin 
it has a very very flimsy origin based on the master morality and slave morality that we i think mo most of us who read nietzsche would have heard about this idea of master morality and slave morality and these ideas are explicated in his in his book on the genealogy of morality and there are three treatises in it the first one is titled good bad good and evil good evil why i have selected it is because we always term something as good and something as bad someone as good someone as evil these are not values which is which has any predestined origin good is a term with which the aristocracy the nobility the powerful actually rated themselves i am good because i am powerful i can take care of others see a term which we associate with goodness the so called goodness had a very different origin a selfish origin where one group of people who had the power and the ability if it was wealth if it was courage for the military group wealth for the uh, the corporate group they took care of themselves and probably showed a little attention to those who were not so powerful so the powerful thought of themselves as good why because we are showing a kind of generosity to others later on by association good came to be associated the term good came to be associated to those qualities also those qualities of courage those qualities of generosity those qualities of reaching out to others and what was bad bad is as the opposite of good it refer to people who are weak powerless who are not so uh, capable they became bad so it he says that nietzsche says that it is based on the master morality that the terms good and bad was first located good or bad as a no opposition to good he also uh, actually points out several terms to say that the root of power courage all these things actually is around good the term good and sometimes bad is associated with black terms for all these things bad evil black these are all collectively or, or you can actually find roots around the same thing then came the priestly class with the priestly class comes another kind of distinction of not just of good and bad the power and the powerless instead the pure and the impure the pure and the impure also came to be added to these things so good came to be synonymous with purity and bad is impurity and later the priestly class you should know was not as courageous as valorous as the early noble aristocratic class they were not warriors so they kind of looked at their position of weak theoretical stance as the good one and by opposition what happened those who are powerful those who wage wars those who are quarrelsome those who are conflict ridden as bad as evil rather i would personally and even in uh, nietzsche and reading also you would know that it is at this place that we have the emergence or the coming up of slave morality from master morality there is a translation or transition to slave morality and what is slave morality the uh, the erstwhile weak 
look at those who inflicted power on them as evil and those who did not react those who suffered everything meekly meekness softness and non quarrelsome qualities they suddenly become termed as good so evil and good from good and bad to e good and evil it is an entirely different social system that is shown by these terms so good and bad which we now associate with innate goodness because you are actually moving in god's direction in god directed ways doing altruistic things no my dears it doesn't have such origins it actually emerges from a sense of power that one group feels over the other thinking that okay i am great because i can do some good to others and feeling bad is because i am at the receiving end or they are at the receiving end so it, it actually begins at the powerful group then the next term the two terms that is good and evil it is reverse it is from slave morality those who are we those who were at the mercy of these powerful people they suddenly feel that we are suffering them in silence so we are actually good they are evil the in those who inflict problems on us they are evil and we are good so power positions in turn becomes a space of evil and uh, you know and uh, again it is in connection with this that we can also talk about the concept of overman the nietzsche and superman which you would see in the stevsky's raskolnikov many people actually look at raskolnikov as a as an embodiment of the nietzsche and superman one who can wade through blood with impunity somebody who can actually be beyond the con the the hold of this good and bad who considers themselves above such categorization now the second three ties in the same book on the genealogy of morals actually take us to this idea of guilt and bad conscience again we say i am guilty i am guilty for of speaking for so long i am guilty about keeping you from having food my dear friend guilt just had a financial beginning it guilt was associated with non payment of debt you take money from somebody you do not pay it back you are guilty and if you are guilty what should you get those who paid money those who loaned you money have the right to exact a penalty from you by way of punishment they were entitled to make you suffer because you did not pay back the guilt so all these all these uh, terms which we think are highly morally laden moral morality laden which probably had a predestined existence which probably came from the divine almighty are reduced to monetary terms to corporate terms in nature and terminology and what is bad conscience bad conscience is again the result of slave morality which nietzsche says characterized the aam aadmi of 19th century they lived in slave morality they felt that they were at the mercy of the great people at the receiving end of everything and it they were all good meek people we do not object to anything we suffer everything in silence and bad conscience as madhu sir kind of left in between to that question bad conscience is supposed to be a reaction to the slave morality not even a slave a uh, reaction it is probably a proaction of this slave morality you feel that something you have not done some you have done something against the moral code which probably had a very financial beginning so guilt bad conscience against god in a world 
where God is dead, how can you do a deed against God? He is not there to assess your right and wrong. It is just the system that determines. And uh, what he says is it is not just even from external forces that make you uh, uh, the, the victim of bad conscience. It is your own internalization of the moral values that characterize the world. And you think that you are supposed to behave in a particular way. And if you don't, you think that, you know, something is pricking me. That actually results in that prick of conscience. It is your fault, not the fault of the system. You have internalized what you are. So slave morality has succeeded in making everyone slaves of the system. And it is the overman, again, the concept of the superman, who can probably tide over all these things and thrive in such a state of, uh, say, position. It is, again, uh, it's a very uh, loaded concept, as Sir would say, but uh, it is here that he speaks about the will to power. Will to power, he considers as the essence of life. The essence of life, that power that makes you assume. Probably, I think, it has come from the time of Renaissance, where the willing, thinking man to, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield that will to power. He puts it against Chopinow's will to life. It is not life as it is, but will to power. Conquer your enemies. If you are your own enemy, conquer that. Rise above. Thrive. Because the world is an oyster for you to, breathe, to, for you to break. You need not, if you are, if you can actually Assume that will to power, you are all supermen, overmen. And the third three ties actually is what is ascetic ideals. To Nietzsche, asceticism, a kind of abstinence from everything, is also the result of slave morality which actually wards you away from, you know, if you cannot be powerful like the nobles, if you cannot be wading, wading through blood with impunity, be the ascetic. There is always glory, you know, there is a kind of carried glory when, when you think that you don't want anything. The dramas of this world is not for me. I keep away. If you don't get it, it is always better to think so. So my dear people, like it is these kind of concepts that made him a master, a proposer of the genealogical method. One who told us, don't be intimidated by the supposed origins. Always look for a historical sense in everything. Place yourself in history and see where you are. And he also spoke about this beautiful idea of perspectivism. Your existence is only a perspective. Your way of looking at things is only a perspective. Perspectives differ. And many postmodernists actually claim that Nietzsche is ours. I don't know if he is of the postmodernist, but perspective is one thing. I think it was, if we inquire into how Nietzsche is, uh, he had dementia, he had a lot of issues, and he collapsed in a, on a road in Turin, and there is his uh, friend who goes and nurses him and later he was put in the care of his sister Elizabeth who was an anti-Semite. She was, and what she did was she made a careful edition of all his work and 
what you have later in will to power and many other work is just an elizabethan edition of the nietzschean world and we find kaufman a biographer doing great things to put nietzsche in a proper place again there was a time he was celebrated in the 1882 to 1890 time like 1888 he was celebrated because he had published a lot of books everyone was talking about nietzsche and people were holding seminars and talking about him his books were in great print but later he suddenly became out of circulation a kind of not so revered figure because of the association people actually brought him to that of nazism it is heard that hitler visited his house and read through his books and because of his that kind of and uh, elizabeth tried to uh, actually edit all the uh, you know edit his work and made it appear good for uh, say hitler so that that kind of an association he he did not comment like he was not there to comment on it so so many people read so many things into the nietzschean world that he was a nazi he was an anti semite he was a post modern he was a misogynist but ultimately the point that i want to make is that he was a genealogist somebody who looked for historical sense in all origins and who tried not to judge just as he puts forth in the world to say him and because i told you i was just looking for what he did for the world what he did for the feminists i would just uh, begin certain comments that he made about women each on women is it not in a worst taste when women set about becoming scientific that way because there was this question about women talking about uh, you should remember it was a time of the emergence of feminism and enlightenment women partaking in enlightenment discussions and he's telling so far enlightenment of this sort was fortunately man's affair what is truth to woman her great art is the lie her highest concern is mere appearance and beauty and he felt that women were lowering themselves when they engage in discussions like this you should remain a thing to look at and a joy forever and not waste your words on the highest philosophical concerns because philosophy was something highly masculine women have poetry to deal with why bother about philosophy we men wish that women should not go on compromising herself through enlightenment another quote another quote to dream perhaps equal rights equal education equal claims and obligations is the highest form of shallowness the emancipation of women there is stupidity in this movement you should remember it was the time of mary wollstonecraft and the like it is defeminization the participation of women in the working of the male world is actually regressive for women and there is one beautiful statement he says if women think like men it will make them sick like men that is one thing which when i was reading through it that's the only sentence which made me happy and but even then i would say i don't know whether i would escape from here but uh, he did good for the feminine cause or the feminist cause because even his uh, one of his greatest critic is derrida he says that in the 
टेक्स्टुअल वर्ल्ड ऑफ नीचे वी वुड सी अ फेमिन ऑपरेशन दिस इज द रिदास कमेंट देर इज अ फेमिन ऑपरेशन इन द वर्ल्ड ऑफ नीचे एंड for the feminists i think we can actually dwell on four things he gave primacy to instinct nietzsche gave primacy to instinct and not reason second he gave primacy to will the individual individu uh, not this individual will but the will to power then his anti egalitarianism in a paradoxical manner and the decadence of western culture is actually i would say these are all beautiful grounds for feminists why because instinct is instinctively associated with the feminine while the rational is supposed to be the fort of the male then anti egalitarianism we are actually talking about in the third fourth wave of feminism we are talking about celebrating the differences and not just begging for equality whenever we speak about women the mic goes off <laughs> patriarchal mics okay so am i audible i think yeah i teach 120 students in a room so <laughs> actually the anti we will keep away the mic if it is difficult okay i don't as charge in the game idea so Okay so the anti egalitarian stance what is egalitarian stance is his he, we found that he does not actually egalitarian the third wave fourth wave feminists are also anti egalitarians we believe in differences not in equality then the major hammer which he had was on the head of the western culture and the decadence of it which was actually a major element in considering women as the other so these are the things in the beginning where we could think of nietzsche as useful for the feminists i don't say he was consciously advocating it but feminists could make use of him like this traditional philosophers have valued mind over body culture over nature reason over unreason truth over illusion good over evil traditionally women have been associated with the body irrational illusionary and of course with the idea of nature and because of its association with women maternity femininity of course the nature of irrationality and the womb etc have been out of the concern of traditional philosophers it actually made them frightened and it was never included in serious discussions of philosophy but if we go through the nietzschean world we would know that his texts are full of the feminine and the woman lots of examples lots of metaphors of the feminine and the feminist thrive in his work and we also have heard about 
the sentence statements like frailty thy name is woman and feminist critics have always challenged the supposed objectivity of philosophy and we would also know that nietzsche as such objected to objectivity his idea of perspectivism of multiple perspective is highly beneficial for a feminist look to look at the issue from all the points how it liberates feminism or, or the woman philosophy written by men about women pretends to be objective and the human experience described by philosophy has always been the male experience and feminists always argue for the revision of existing ones and here is where we can make use of nietzsche nietzsche's idea of western morality western concept of and he is anti egalitarianism and his idea of perspectivism have all been useful to us and different perspectives are necessary to arrive at objective truth so whatever has been considered as absolute truth and absolutely objective truth by traditional western philosophers are undermined by the nietzschean stand which in in redirection could be made use of by feminist to argue their point that no absolute truth is possible and if woman is considered as submissive subjugated the other there is no divine sanction for that because there is no god willing it it is just an accident which could be replaced by another reversal of forces in a near future in this continuum and again nietzsche is one person who brought back the primacy of body also that is again locating it in the a uh, female and he challenges the hierarchy of reason over irrationality and says that it is just a product of the grammar of language reason he he actually refers to reason as a deceptive old witch again i don't like the association with the old witch but since it destabilizes reason we can take it and in his early essay on truth and lie in the ultra moral sense nietzsche says that words are not just reflection of things he questions the notion that language reflects reality by speaking about how how reality is sometimes created by language he says that language does not reflect reality instead reality is created by language so the reality of women the reality of men everything is also a creation just constructions which can easily be demolished so the women's inferiority and submissive position can be seen just as linguistic creations so again as i said earlier unreason is back into philosophy and that is where the female self generally belongs the instinctual the emotional the irrational and it does not postulate nietzsche as approving of women but still i say we can appropriate nietzsche for putting it for a feminist position there is a comment you know lou salom his uh, his contemporaries and a very close associate he ident uh, she identified in nietzsche's own writing as feminine and uh, as i told earlier Derrida also spoke about the feminine operation in the Nietzschean world. I'll just uh, quote from Derrida: "The manifold typology in his work, its horde of mothers, 
daughters sisters old maids wives governesses prostitutes virgins grandmothers big and little girl and his texts are full of references to maternity and femininity and so i think in willing and reason in demolishing the western traditional values which had deprived women of the opposition in willing body over mind in willing perspectivism in bringing out genealogy my dear friends he could be appropriated for the feminist cause and i conclude my presentation with one quote from him life despite all the changes in appearance is at bottom indestructibly powerful and pleasurable on this note i wind up my presentation thank you